To be at the first ever TEDx in Bolton is uh, an honour. Uh, so I'd like to thank Ianis for inviting me, and also I'd like to thank the volunteers for all their hard work in, in making it possible. Uh, like you just heard, I, I'm just an ordinary guy. Um, and basically, my, my story starts September the 19th, 2006. For most people, a pretty unremarkable day. For me, the day my life changed forever. I was at work cleaning out the drum of an industrial blender. The drum started to spin. It shouldn't have been done, but it did. Uh, I got dragged inside, and my arm became trapped against the drum wall. The drum stopped, and then after a few seconds, it changed direction. My arm was still stuck and was being used as a brake. I felt my arm being squeezed and stretched. I heard the bone snap, so I knew it was kind of serious. The drum finally stopped, and uh, I was hanging. I figured it best to wait for help. About 30 minutes later, I'm, I'm still stuck. The emergency services have turned up, but health and safety, they can't reach me. I'm getting desperate, so when one of my colleagues threw a screwdriver to me, I, I caught it and I used it to dig myself free. I climbed out of the drum and then the paramedics took over. Things get kind of hazy, but for that first week, I think I went to two different hospitals where three different consultants used four operating theatres and five teams of surgeons to perform over six operations on me. On the seventh day, I lay in bed pumped full of morphine as they took the bandages off. My left leg was cut from my hip to my knee and a big chunk had been cut away and grafted to my arm. My arm was a mess. There were scars and stitches everywhere with this, this big lump of leg wrapped around the middle. Um, think Popeye meets Frankenstein. Get the idea. The doctors then tell me that this is just the beginning. I'm, I'm facing an awful lot more surgery. But I don't know whether it's the morphine or the doctors speak. The only thing I really understand is that my treatment could take up to 10 years and there are no guarantees. So when I left the hospital, uh, I turned to the internet, trying to find out exactly what I was letting myself in for, what my options were, and how my life could be affected. Six months go by, and it, my arm's getting no better. To me, it feels like it's already died, and I feel like I'm dying with it. So after speaking with a surgeon, I chose amputation. I'd been told that I could get the best treatment possible. My company had really good insurance. It wouldn't be a problem. Unfortunately, the small print meant that I wasn't covered. So when I'd healed, I was sent to the NHS. The first arm I got is what they call a passive limb. It's a, a dummy arm, like you see in a shop window. It, it looks like an arm. It's got no function. And it's held in place with what they call a, a socket liner. This is a silicon sock, it's tapered, it rolls over the stump, and then the prosthetic fits over the top. The sockets and the liners that the NHS supply or are supplied, they all taper, which normally isn't a problem. In my case, in order to give me the longest stump possible, they cut straight through the thickest part of my graft. So instead of having a tapered arm, mine flares. This is where I had the first set of problems, my first hurdle. If I wore a liner that was comfortable at the end of my arm, it was so big at the top that my arm would eventually slide off. If I wore one that was secure, it was so tight, I'd be in pain within an hour. The socket, to me, is probably the most important part of the whole thing, because if you can't wear it all day, every day, without pain and discomfort, it doesn't matter how good the piece on the end is. It will end up in the cupboard unused. Eventually, I was upgraded to what they call a body-powered system. Um, again, mine didn't fit very well. It was uncomfortable to use, painful to wear. It was a hook designed over 100 years ago and controlled with a piece of string and an elastic band. 
My life is sort of going downhill. I can't really understand why things aren't, aren't getting any better for me. I noticed at one stage that maybe two years after my accident, I noticed a change in other people's attitudes towards me. Strangers will normally avoid me. They'll cross the road, they'll walk away. Very rarely do make pe people make eye contact or start conversations with me. They stop, they stare, some will point, some will laugh, others will just throw insults at me. I stopped going out. I became really withdrawn and I'd spend sometimes days on end locked out in my garage, just me and my demons. Physically, I was a wreck. The strong, fit, active Nigel that I used to know, he, he disappeared. The guy that I saw looking at me at, in the mirror had dead eyes. I'd put on over three stone in weight. My left arm was also damaged. I'd been the provider for and the protector of my family. Suddenly I found myself needing help just to wipe my backside. So psychologically I was in a, a really dark place. I moved into the spare room. I didn't, I didn't sleep well at all. Nights were for the nightmares. I'd wake up screaming, covered in sweat, banging the wall, whatever. Days, days were for the mood swings, massive highs, crashing lows, fears, self-doubts, frustration, and anger. Sudden, raging anger that I quite often unfairly took out on my, my wife and my son. I was so busy losing my mind that I didn't realize that they too had lost my arm. I stayed indoors for quite a while and eventually, at the end of 2009, my life was about to change yet again. Bang, heart attack, dead, game over. Or so I thought. Mr. Denson at uh, Papworth Hospital, he thought differently. He put half a dozen stents into my heart and sent me off to rehab. So now we fast forward a little bit to 2011. I've been upgraded, I've been using a myoelectric, um, a grypher, quite ugly, but efficient, fast, strong, and easy to use. And after saving for a few years, I managed to get enough money together to have this made privately. Like I said earlier, this is the most important part. Um, on my one, it has a, a silicon liner underneath here. This has been custom made to fit my stump perfectly. It won't fit anyone else, just me. In the liner, I have electrodes on either side. They're embedded into the liner and they touch my skin. As we move forward down, this white thing is an air valve. So I push my arm in and I get a vacuum. It gives me a, a secure fit. If you wanna just take my wrist. If you just give it a pull. So, <laughs> sorry. It's, it's, a, it's a good fit. Uh, no one's yet managed to pull it off. Um, further down, this is where I, I plug in of a night time, plug into the mains and recharge. The batteries are down here. And then right at the end, I've got what I call the most useful part. It's a wrist rotator. It means I don't have to use this arm to move the hand around. I can just do it with the electricity. And then on the end, I've got this, the B-Bionic V3. I got this purely by chance. While I was having this made, the prosthesis phoned me, he said, there's a company in Leeds called RSL Steeper. They've got a new hand, and they're looking for someone to test it. I gave them your name. And a short while later, I became, I think, the first person in the world to start long-term testing of the V3. So here's my hand, and, and this is what it does. It's myoelectric. So effectively, if you want to bend your arm, your brain will send a signal to your body. Your body will generate its own electricity, and that makes the muscle contract. It's exactly the same for me. If I want to open my hand, 
my body generates electrical charges until it hits the electrode down here. The electrode here will then pick up on that signal and it will send it down to the hand and the software within the hand will open it up. Here, likewise, if I want to close my hand, I imagine, for example, I'm squeezing a ball and it closes. So opening is open a beer, squeeze a ball. And if you're a guy and you can't open beer and squeeze balls, <laughs> perhaps you shouldn't have one of these. Um, most myoelectrics will just do the one operation. This has actually eight grips on it. It's what they call power grip. I call this my handshake grip. This is my human grip. Um, if I'm, I move my hand this way, it's a manual thumb. Uh, some of the prosthetics that are coming out nowadays have electric thumbs. This is manual. It's no big deal to use, and it also keeps the price down by about 10 grand. So this is for reading books. Um, if I'm typing on the keyboard, I can type. Obviously, the hand's in the wrong place, so I move the wrist over. If I want to use my mouse, well, then we can. <laughs> but you can also, I also have fun with it. Um, but I particularly like when I'm out and about kids. Kids tend to stare sometimes, and they do get a little bit freaked out. So we give it this. That tends to freak them out. And if that doesn't get their attention, well, then we just... <laughs> we just go all the way around. And then, obviously, you need to tell kids that, you know, things are all right. Since I've started wearing this, the effect it's had on my life has, has been extraordinary. I noticed that the negative reactions I faced every day, they just stopped. People still stare, but they don't walk away. People tend to laugh with me, not at me. We speak and I show off a bit. But the best thing for me is what I call the bee bionic effect. It's when we shake hands, they smile. People always smile and it's a genuine smile. And I see the handshakes and the smiles as a sign of acceptance for who I am. And really, isn't that what any of us want? Acceptance? I can think of maybe five occasions in the last five years when I've been wearing this and I've been insulted by people. Sadly, four of those occasions have been by women. And two of them have been women with different abilities. I say different abilities because, personally, I don't like the word disability. I don't believe anyone has a right to dis a person's ability. Amputees live in a world that's not been designed for them. And yet, given the right opportunities, we, we can thrive, we can be part of society just like anyone else, instead of leaving, living on the fringes and feeling like we don't belong. So, all I would say to people is, if you find yourself in a situation when you, you see me, you need to understand that I am a reflection of your own mortality. I understand this now, I didn't before. I understand where the looks of pity and fear come from. I reflect your mortality. You see someone who's obviously disfigured, it's a pretty harsh reminder of just how easily damaged we can be. It's something we don't want to deal with. We don't know what to say. We, we really don't want to offend. Self-preservation takes over and we walk away. All I would say is when you see that, if you see someone in the street, if you make eye contact with them, please try not to turn away. Maybe smile, maybe a wink, perhaps a hi, how's it going? You might be the first stranger that's actually spoken to them that day, and that's a big deal. Before I finish up, I know it's been really rapid, but before I finish up, if I could just say thanks to each and every one of you, because whether you know it or not, just by being here, you've all been part of my new and different life. And I'd urge you to go and become part of someone else's different life. I remember just before getting this, uh, I was speaking with a psychiatrist. And he said to me, where do you see yourself in a year or so? I thought about it for a while. 
I said, oh, I'll be out in a field somewhere in the countryside, sitting in my car with a hose pipe attached to the exhaust. I wasn't trying to be a drama queen. That's all I could see. I was so wrong. Because a year or so later, I was standing on stage for the first time in my life, sharing my story. This, I'm so fortunate to wear. It's given me back a life when I thought mine was over. It's a new and different life. And given an opportunity, and given the right technology, given the right help, we can all live new and different lives. I've now been fortunate to meet several people who have been fitted with the same sort of technology. There are 300 of us in the world. That might sound like a lot, but there are 30 million amputees. 20 million have no access to any sort of prosthetics. Maybe it's about time we started changing our attitudes towards the people that we call disabled. Because if we can change attitudes, we can change lives. If we change lives, we can change the world. You guys have been part of my life. I thank you for it. And I urge you, again, go out and become part of someone else's new and different life. It's worth it. Thank you.